it was was um, between the depression then and then 1932 was the um, price. Okay. The price of things. The, the price of things are what? That they have gone up. Like okay. Sure. Yes, Bells. Uh, he mentions that the African American was born into the depression. Ah, I like and that point. He mentions how it only becomes official when it hits the majority of the population, which happens to be the man. I love that point, right? He's like, the depression? What's the depression, right? Like, I was born in the depression. I was raised in the depression. I am the depression. I like, too, that, that he points out that these big wheels, what do you think of when he says, why do these big wheels kill themselves? Who, what does he mean by big wheels there? So top, about the middle, halfway down. Why, why do these big wheels kill themselves? Who are the big wheels he refers to? No. Go. Like the, rich the rich people, right? The big deals. The, why do the big deals in society? Why are they all killing themselves? Because their lifestyle changed so much. Because they're the ones who couldn't live up to what the failure that had happened to them. Whereas he was saying in, in black communities, you don't see Great Depression caused suicide in general because this isn't that much of a change. Yeah. Or right, he mentions one black guy that kills himself, but it was a black guy that what? That, that, was, that was rich, that bought stock, that didn't act black in his mind. All right, it says, uh, I remember a friend of mine, he didn't know he was a Negro. I mean, he acted like he never knew it. He got tied downtown with some stock. He blew about 20000 He came home and drank a bottle of poison. But it was a rarity to hear a Negro killing himself over a financial situation. Because, to his original point, he's born in the Great Depression. This isn't new. Excellent. For the woman, what is her perspective on the Great Depression? Um, Costanza, go ahead. On the woman's perspective? Yeah, that's exactly what I just said. Um, well, at first, um, they were experiencing, like, they were experiencing things that they never experienced before, like being cold. They, like, that's what black, black men have experienced for most of the time. But then they experience some, well, some like. I'm not explaining. Clearly. Oh, yeah. Um. Adrian, take a shot at it. Uh, what's her experience like? Uh, she talks about how her father lost his job because of the Great Depression. So stop there. Her father lost his job. Keep going. And the WPA helped her dad find a job. You guys read about the WPA, I hope, I imagine, very important organization, the Works Progress Administration. Cool. Did that help or not, Adrian? Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, kind of, because it brought lots of food and stuff like Yeah. It, it, it saved them economically, but where did it hurt them? It hurts socially. Why? How? They have jobs that are considered low, I guess. There it is. So then from this person's perspective, good job. Uh, got a her dad got a job at the Works Progress Administration. Then later she goes to nursing school and all these people are talking trash about the works. All oh, these people are lazy, they're doing this, they're, they're just hanging out, getting paid. And she's thinking to herself like they don't know. They don't know what it was like to have been in the middle of the Great Depression because they didn't live it. I lived it. So two really interesting perspectives, right? From, from what I consider the underreported parts of the Great Depression, where yeah, a bunch of white people lose their money and their jobs, but there also is other factors that need to play a role that we need to understand in terms of how deep this depression actually goes. Yes, sir. Hey, Sydney, Sarita, and George Sophia. Cool. Go, go, don't come back. Let me come back, but come back better. All right, today uh, we're covering FDR and the New Deal, it is a a big day, it's a big lecture, uh, with a little movie clip and some text in there as well. I know, I know. Uh, we'll wrap up a little bit of Hoover's administration uh, and his response in general. In one word, what does Hoover do to respond to the Great Depression? No, 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 no. God, you guys are so smart. Nothing! It'll fix itself. Prosperity's just around the corner. Absolutely. So your key concepts I put up here in quite detail. 
But I want to focus before we start talking on 7.1.3, which says during the 1930s, so during the Great Depression, policymakers respond to the mass unemployment and social upheavals of the Great Depression by transforming the U.S. into a limited welfare state, redefining the goals and ideas of modern American liberalism. If you can tell me how this takes place at the end of today, how the American society has been transformed into a welfare state, and we've redefined what liberalism means, mission accomplished. When I say the words welfare state, what kinds of things come to mind? Go ahead. Government help. Government help. Boom, boom, done. The government serving a purpose that the government didn't serve before. Question. Do you need something like the social gospel and settlement houses if you have a welfare state? No, why not? No, that's social Darwinism. Oh. Social gospels like Jane Addams, settlement houses, private citizens should help the poor. Okay. Um, then it is, it is connected to so, like, the idea that you have to help, um, you have to give out and help others in order to like them better themselves. So where can we do that? Like, kind of, but in a in a welfare state, who's the one giving out the welfare? The, the, government. the government. So would you need private citizens to be doing it? No. No, right? This is the opposite of of, of social Darwinism. The government should help you. This is the full opposite to your point of social Darwinism, right? And American liberalism in terms of like using the government to push for progress, as opposed to having the government keep their hands off. So it's a very important trend. This is why I say that, that this 1930s are so important in American history because it's a full switch from a hands-off government to a hands-on government, economically and socially. But up to this point, with that small exception of the progressive era, in general, the government's kept their hands off of things, mostly off of the economy, laissez-faire economics, mostly off of social things, let social Darwinism play its role, like we're going to keep our hands off of things. The Great Depression changes that. And not because of Hoover, because of FDR afterwards. Excellent. Let's get cracking. Here's your prompt. Terry, read it for us. Louder, Terry. Every day. He doesn't have a louder. Try again, Terry. Evaluate the extent to which the new deal effectively dealt with the problems of the Great Depression. How much did the New Deal effectively solve the problems of the Great Depression? Cool. So ideally when you're reading, you already have something of an answer. You did a pretty decent job here, fell a little short there, and we'll get there by the end of today. Monday, we'll talk about two things. We'll talk about the legacy of the New Deal and some of the downsides of the New Deal, some of FDR's shady tactics that kind of kill his credibility a little bit. Uh, the critiques of the New Deal from conservatives that say it went too far, did too much. Liberals who say it didn't do enough. I can never please everybody. And then we'll look at, because of, because of the Great Depression and other reasons, why American remains isolationist at the end of the 30s. So next week we'll do that on Monday. Wednesday, Thursday we'll do a War II, and then your test is the following Monday. All right, your test is still scheduled for March 1st. We're marching along. Uh, the dogs may bark, but the caravan marches on. All right, you may bitch and moan, but we're going to keep moving. Cool, and I emailed you guys yesterday. I didn't get any responses to my nice email with a screenshot and everything. Nobody wanted to reply to that? Thank you. You're welcome. You didn't see it? Of course not. Shocking. Terry didn't see the email. Uh, what did the email say? 79 days. Nice little picture of the countdown. Now it's 78 days. So we got 78 days till game day. Please be aggressive, be proactive, be productive. Don't take any excuses from anybody else or for yourself. What? I'm sure you're teaching here. I'm just taking these people. Uh, for one reason. Excellent. Tell them lunch starts in about an hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> so here's the outline today, the Hoover legacy. I put blankets, flags, and armies. That'll make more sense in a minute. The Hoover legacy is a tarnished one. The election of 1932, when we get FDR as president, FDR's first 100 days, super important in transforming the American system. The New Deal, the three R's in practice read about, relief, reform, recovery. Uh, and the New Deal's successes and shortcomings. So to remind ourselves of what causes this disaster, right? 
A bunch of causes. We talked about them yesterday. Monetary policy. Tariffs. The punishment of Europe after World War I. Ruins markets where we used to sell our stuff. Overproduction in both industry and agriculture. The unequal distribution of wealth is a whole bunch of things that cause the Great Depression. There's no way you can say there's one thing that causes it. Uh, political policies cause it. Remember my problem, my, my line, the business of America is business. That's going to cause problems. By doing everything that favors business, business is going to take advantage. Eventually, that's going to collapse. The cutting of taxes on the rich, the high tariffs, uh, lending of all this money to European countries, even though know, they can't pay it back after World War I. A whole bunch of political disasters. Financial practices as well. The entire installment, buying on credit, buying on margin for stocks, leading to the crash, that causes it as well. Uh, the economic situations are a deep cause of overproduction and consumers being too confident in the economy and the socioeconomic conditions of the rich having all the money and the poor having nothing. Right, that's a problem. The top 1% owning about a third of the nation's wealth, mathematically speaking, the top 1% needs to own more than 1% because it wouldn't be the top 1%, but that's a bad ratio of wealth to percentage. Right? It's a very top-heavy proportion. So all of that during the 1920s and even before leads us into the Great Depression. Now, why is this depression worse than all of our other panics? Why? What do you guys think? Take 30 seconds to talk to your table. Why is this the Great Depression, whereas before we have a panic of 1819, 1837, 1873, 1890, and none of them are considered the Great Depression. What makes this one worse? Take 30 seconds, try to figure it out, go. Because, uh, because our all right, uh, Josh, what do you think? Why is this one the Great Depression as opposed to just one other depression? Uh, well, I said there's like a lot of factors that play into it, and then also uh, I feel like when the economy and all stuff that affected like uh, the most of like all the American people. Okay. So the fact that it involves all the industries, cool. Uh, Scarlett, what else? Um, it was probably like the Great Depression caused like the it had the highest rate of unemployment, twenty five percent. Why though? Because of these factors. Terry, what do you think? Um, maybe because they have no really good way to recover from it. Never have, right? Up to this point, Hoover was right. It goes through like. Depression, recovery, backup, recession. Why is this the one that goes down and it just keeps going down? Ventura, what do you think? Um, you little pee head. <laughs> I think it's because it might have it like affected other countries as well, not just the U.S. Definitely a definitely a, a a problem, and that this is a worldwide depression. Uh, and I'll build off that point, and I'll just stop asking for answers at this point because as our world has become interconnected and our economy's gotten bigger and interconnected, it's a bigger tree. And bigger trees fall harder. Right? Like if Scarlet falls down, it's not that dangerous. She's close oh, to the yeah. ground. <laughs> right? If somebody much taller falls down, it's a longer way to go. So because our economy is so much bigger and our whole world is so much more interconnected, when it collapses, it has a longer way to go down. And because our, our economy is propped up by so many things, the stock market and tariffs and this and that, you can't just let it recover itself because it didn't build itself. So because our economy is not built by itself, it cannot recover by itself. That's the key here. Up to this point, all the other panics are caused by like, oh, we had too many railroads. Build less railroads, problem solved. Oh, we loaned too much money for Western land. Load less money for Western land, problem solved. Because our economy is so big and interconnected and propped up by so many different factors, now that it collapses, it's not going to just build itself back up. All right? It's not just a tree falling down into a forest. A tree may regrow. Forest takes much longer and much more support. So I'm not going to go over this. Don't worry. This is just a really good slide that helps us understand depression by the numbers. Showing. This is the stock market. It goes from, and you don't need to understand the numbers. Just look at the scope. From 381 to 41 in three years. That's a big drop. Stocks drop about 90%. Remember my whole buy on margin thing? Now I owe $110 on that same stock, but it's worth 10. 
That's not good. Consumer prices fall, wholesale prices fall, unemployment gets to 25%, but unemployment is also regional. In places like Toledo, Ohio, where they're very coal mining dependent, unemployment's 90%. Think about that, 90%. Nine out of every 10 people is out of a job for a whole city. What do you do? How do you even address that? Our gross domestic product, what our economy is producing as a whole, gets cut in half. Our national income, the whole country's income, goes down $30 billion. Our salaries decline 40%, but if you're manufacturing, if you're doing manual labor and manufacturing, you're down 60%. Farmers' income declines 55%. Our industrial, what our country's producing is down 50% by 1932. Our investments are down 90%, and we're having less kids as a result. Because who would want to bring a child into this situation? Right, if you're in Toledo, Ohio, and you're around 90% of the people in your city are unemployed, how are you about to have a kid? So it affects literally all of society from the money on down. Now, we talked about Hoover's response and his lack of action, his lack of empathy, because he believes the business cycle will correct itself. All of that comes to a head with a bonus army. So June of 1932, there are a lot of unemployed army veterans. Now, what war did they fight in? World War I, right? So they've been out of the war for 15 years, and they served the country. We should take care of these people. They're unemployed, and they were going to get a bonus. That's why there's the bonus army. They're an army people. They're going to get a bonus. You see? They push strikes again. I know. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, they're going to get a bonus in 1945 from Congress for serving in World War I. They want that bonus now. Why do they want that bonus now? Because they're in the middle of depression. They have no job, they have no money, they have nothing. And they're thinking, oh, we serve the country, the country should help us out. They petition, they write, they sign a long petition, they all sign it, asking Congress to pay the bonuses at early. Pay us now in 1932, as opposed to 1945. They march to DC, 20,000 of them, that's a lot of people, and Congress says, no, sorry, wait 13 years, you'll get your money. Now, should they just pack up and go home? No. What's at home? Nothing. Nothing. So they just stay. Okay. They put up a camp around Washington, D.C., in the shadow of the Capitol building, and they stay. What do they call it? Hoovervilles. Much like you listen to this grant and grantism as a sign for corruption, anything that's something bad is named after the president, it's a bad sign for your legacy. So the bonus army built Hoovervilles around the city, looks like this, as you can see. This is a shanty town, a Skid Row esque collection of boxes and cardboard and wood, and these veterans are just living there saying, Give us the money we deserve and we'll leave. Hoover's response Send the army. Hoover sends the army to get rid of the old army. General Douglas MacArthur, a name that will play a role in World War II. Junior officer Dwight D. Eisenhower, future president, a name that will play a role in World War II. And General George S. Patton, future large role in the army and World War II and Korea. So three really important names later take their troops and literally evict these people from where they are staying. Now, who's in the wrong here? It, it is what it is, right? There, it's illegal for them to just be living there, but to use the military to force them out is also excessive. It is a public relations debacle. It makes Hoover, who already looks terrible for doing nothing for the Depression, it makes him look even worse because it shows him as very insensitive uh, to the human part of the Depression. The optics, how it looks to public opinion is, oh my God, these people fought in World War I, and you just sent the army to kick them out of this homeless camp they're living in? That's terrible. That's terrible. Here are some pictures that I want you to just take a look at. What stands out? Fire. Yeah, absolutely. What else? The uh, capital in the background. What stands out? The flags. These veterans are just asking for support and help from a government that is just falling on deaf ears. They're flying the flag they earned fighting for the country, and they're having all whatever 
possessions they have left in their world lit on fire literally in the shadow of the Capitol building. America. But this translates to other places as well. Everywhere you go, the public hates Hoover. He says things in press conferences like, nobody's actually starving. Which then makes it even more unpopular to people that are starving. Newspapers become called Hoover Blankets. Yeah. Because people can't afford blankets and they're using newspapers, so they're blaming Hoover for their cold, Hoover Blankets. Broken down cars that are being pulled by mules. Your car broke down, you can't afford to fix it. You have a, a, a hybrid donkey horse mule. Pulling it are called Hoover Wagons. And empty pockets like this, people ask for money, like, I don't have any money, I'll pull my pocket out to show you. Hoover flags. <laughs> Story of my life, I have a lot of Hoover flags going on. It's funny, every, every pair of pants is the same. They're all empty. So the idea being that they're, they're attaching Hoover's name to everything negative about the Depression. Now, is the Depression Hoover's fault? No. no. Is his response his fault? Yeah. yeah, but that's his ideology. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very important that we look at at the, the images of the Depression to really understand like how deep this hits. How deep this hits. Now I'm going to show you a clip. Oh no, what? Is it a song? No. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No, it is not a song. It's an actual documentary. This series is the best, the best, best, best resource for the 20th century. It's called The Century, America's Time. And my, my urging to you is to start watching it with your homework. Because it's a documentary that answers a lot of your questions. And there's an episode for like every five or six years. I have them on DVD. I can send you the links on YouTube. I got them. All right. So this is just the one at the beginning of the Great Depression, okay? I don't need you taking notes. I just want you to watch. You like her? But notes wouldn't hurt. It was May of 1932. It's a spectacle unparalleled in the history of the country. And something was very wrong in the land of plenty. A day of bloodshed and riot. There were those of us who felt that America was teetering on the brink of revolution. For three years, the Great Depression had tormented Americans. Now, 20,000 Army veterans and their families came pouring into Washington to find out what the government was going to do about it. They were bearded, they were ragged, they were desperate. You could see it in their eyes. They'd been promised a bonus for their service in World War I, but it was not due to be paid until 1945. The desperate veterans wanted their money now. They were called the Bonus Army. On July 28th, the Bonus Army came to blows when Washington police shots were fired. President Herbert Hoover barricaded himself in the White House and called out the troops. Soldiers have orders to burn down the unsanitary and... So it's important to note that Hoover was, is scared they're going to overrun the White House, and he barricades himself in the White House, terrified. Oh, oh poor little guy. He probably barricaded himself with like three cheeseburgers <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a gilded hot dog. Excellent. Hoover blankets. Yeah, no, he had actual blankets. They're just called Hoover blankets because they're his. Illegal camp. They said tanks. Right. When the smoke cleared, two veterans and an infant were dead. The absolutely shameful. The sacrifice of the young American boys. Put such an impression on me. I have never forgotten. They were just trying to feed their families. Millions of Americans could no longer provide for their families. With nowhere to turn for help, they were angry and they were approaching their breaking point. Three years into the Depression, the American system was in grave danger. Unless it could change and change quickly, it might not survive. Bad times had arrived without warning. After a decade of expanding prosperity, almost overnight, 
the Wall Street crash of 1929 shattered America's confidence in its economy. I was 11 years old, but how well I remember. It was like the skies had grown dark, thunder, and all of a sudden the faces were tragic, and people were walking around in the hallways of our building and in the streets with, with inquiring eyes and saying, has it happened to you? Has it happened to us? What is happening? The Living Telegram at that time. At Pretty Stone, you could feel a horror. Behind the door, you were knocking. When you knock on the door, when the voice marks, yes, who, who is it, who is it? I say, I have a telegram. Oh, slide it on me, the door. Slide it on Or go away. Get away from me. Get away from me. The collapse of the New York Stock Exchange in 1929 was only the most visible sign of a massive economic crisis. A crisis that spread quickly from Wall Street to Main Street. Miriam Johnson was living in California when the Great Depression arrived at her house. I was 11 when the crash came. My father at that time, along with a few friends, owned a small grocery store. One day he came home and, and he laid two dollars on the table in the kitchen. And he said, no more store. Everything is gone. And that was the end. For us, it was the end. Every day produced more bankruptcies, more layoffs, more people with less money in their pockets. Even U.S. Steel, a symbol of American industrial might since the turn of the century, was brought to its knees. In three years, the entire full-time payroll was laid off. 225,000 workers. So think on that. I'm about two more in the clip. But U.S. Steel was like one of the trademark industries of all of period six. Look at the way Carnegie and the Bessemer process, and they monopolized steel, and they changed the whole infrastructure of, of the country and the world, and railroads, and bankrupt, three years. 235,000 employees, mostly in places like Toledo, Ohio, and this iron belt here of Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Almost a quarter of a million employees laid off, just like that, no more job. So it's hitting small grocery stores like that lady's fathers in California, and it's hitting massive corporations like U.S. Steel. And think of the implications and the ramifications for what that means for communities, for families, for futures. The, the depression hit this country all over. It hit the farm areas, it hit the cities. You were just there, out of work and out of food. Uh, and everybody was baffled. You know, nobody had ever had that experience before. I had been saving for maybe five, six years, a piggy bank, money in a piggy bank. Nickels, pennies, dimes the most. It turns out that I was the only one in the family that had any money. Because one day I came home and I grabbed hold of my piggy bank just to give it a shake. And there was nothing in it. My mother was looking at me and she said, your father borrowed the money. He has to go out to look for work and he needed money to go downtown. And he came home and I didn't say anything, but my eyes, face was swollen with tears. My eyes were blinking with tears. And my father took me in his arms and he said, I'm sorry, I have to have money. But it's a loan, I'll pay it back to you. 
seconds what stands out to you about this clip of people's experiences in the Great Depression share with your partner what what's a takeaway for for the way that the depression hits people 30 seconds chat it out go what's a takeaway for how the depression hits people Who doesn't last forever? You overproduce it, it goes stale. Hey, Seuss, what you got for me? The way it often is bigger is that no matter if you're higher or low class, they're all affected in the same way. They all need money, jobs, food, life. Excellent. Appreciate that. Ramos. Every business was affected from little to big corporations. Fair. Bells. Um, yeah, good point. Every age, right? Like, this poor girl. At a little piggy bank, right? And that sounds stupid, but, like... Imagine like every, like you know every two three weeks, maybe we'll save a nickel or a dime. Like in one day, you're gonna have some money to buy, and then it's just gone. Cause your dad, like just the emotional aspect of your dad needing to go downtown and try to find a job. Did he find a job? No, of course, there's no jobs. Right? Or like owning a business and like having to sell your grocery store for two bucks. Now, I love the line in there that says the depression like started on Wall Street with the with the stock market crash, and then it moved to Main Street. Cause every town has a Main Street. But it started there, and then the ripple effect of that collapsing hits everywhere else. Val had a really good question. She's like, wasn't one of the causes of the Great Depression uh, overproduction of farm goods? Why are these people going hungry? Phenomenal question. Because it's a capitalist system. you got to pay for the food. You don't have money, you can't eat. Food would rather go bad. And as well, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, you can't produce food that's going to last forever, right? It, it, goes, it goes bad eventually. So... Here's some pictures for you that you saw a little bit of yesterday. It's a very famous picture, very famous picture, as is this. They all are. These people are just, they're all dressed in suits, wanted a job with their resume on there. And I probably had great jobs before. So just take a minute and a half with the person next to you, please. Uh, it's a very uh, poignant but right to the point cartoon. Minute 30. Uh, what aspects, what parts of the Great Depression are demonstrated in this cartoon? What's demonstrated in this cartoon? What do we see? Uh, um, Cartoon, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, let me hear from Rodas. What, what parts of the Great Depression are demonstrated? What do we see here? Or he had it in the bank and the bank went bankrupt. Because what if, because your news flash, when you put 100 bucks in the bank, the bank doesn't take that 100 bucks and go put it in an envelope labeled Scarlet's Money. 
Banks don't do that. They take your money and they invest it so they can make money off of your money. So it works now, so it works then. But then the banks could take your money and put it into risky investments like the stock market. So if I put my money in Emily's bank, Emily turned around and put my money in the stock market, the stock market crashed. I go back to put my money in Emily's like, uh, yeah, about that money. <laughs> See, <laughs> the way the stock market works is gone. Okay. I close the door. Rash it down. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. So like, it's not just he did save money. He's he's well dressed, or he was well dressed. He's now quite uh, looks dirty and worn. He's had a rough time. Yeah, he did save money when times were good in the 1920s. But my argument to you is times weren't ever actually that good. They look good. Very gilded age-esque, but the economic troubles of the 20s are underneath and bubbling, ready to explode, and then they finally do, hence the Great Depression. Now, with America's great luck, shortly after the Great Depression begins, they go through an environmental disaster. Because when things are bad, things are really bad. Shortly after the Great Depression, uh, America's farm Midwest, to Valerie's question, goes through the dust bowl, which is just what it sounds, a bowl of dust, except the bowl covers like seven states and the dust is everywhere. So starting in 1930, we start seeing dust storms, which are just what they say, storms of dust, uh, which doesn't sound that bad until I show you the pictures. If you take a look at this map right here, the dust bowl is right here in the middle of the country, northern Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, right through this area that was largely settled because of what? I hear you. The Homestead Act. We were going out there and farming, and we talked then about closing the frontier, where you're farming land that probably isn't that great for farming anyway. Right? Because why? It's dry. It's dry. Yeah, right? So we're, we're pulling all the irrigation we can from other places. We're over-farming it, because the only way to make your money. We're overproducing. Next thing we know, we ruined our soil and we ruined our environment in the Midwest. So a couple of things caused this dust bowl overgrazing. So letting our, our cows specifically eat up all the grass because what does grass do? It keeps soil in place. Interesting. Damn cows, exactly. <laughs> Improper farming techniques. So for example, we talk about dry farming and pulling water out deep out of the uh, earth to, to water your farms so and there's no natural irrigation there. Increased cultivation. Farming more stuff, which is a fancy word for overproduction. And then in 1934, there's a really bad drought. So now whatever water was there is gone. It's super dried out. Bless you. What follows the drought? A ton of wind. So now we have wind that is picking up generations of dust. That is only dust because you've overfarmed it and you've overgrazed it. And now there's nothing to hold the dust there anymore. And next thing you know, uh, we have half of the country covered in dust. Already in the Great Depression. April 14th of 1935, we have 300 million tons of topsoil. 300 million tons of dirt blown across the southern plains, blocking out the sun for days. Chicago, which is here. Los Angeles, which is here, uh, are both, and Chicago much, much, much worse, are covered in dust. Doesn't sound that bad, but we are in the middle of a Great Depression, and that dust has come from 6,000 miles away. Life sucks. Uh, this causes people from these areas who are already struggling to migrate. The Okies are going to migrate from Oklahoma, here we go again, to places like California, Chicago. We see in this time period Mexican repatriation of Mexican farmers in the Southwest being asked kindly to go back to Mexico because there's nothing for them here. Cesar Chavez gets evicted, as a small boy, gets evicted off of his farm in the Southwest. So this environmental disaster causes social ramifications as well. Here are some pictures which show you what I'm talking about. Yeah, oh, oh what happens? More than just a dust storm. Now you guys care. So photo-driven society. Just teach you on Instagram. 
Yeah, Grapes of Wrath. I'll talk about that on Monday. Grapes of Wrath by Steinbeck. All of Steinbeck, John Steinbeck of Mice and Men, Grapes of Wrath. All of these things come up with the migration that come from the Dust Bowl. Those farmers that are mice and men, Lenny, our friend from fifth period, he is, it's all driven by the Dust Bowl. Yeah, I bet you do. But look at this, look at somebody's farm. It's buried under six to eight feet of dust. Look at that. What if you looked at your window one morning and you saw that outside? <laughs> oh, Jesus has come back. The rapture is here. Take me, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> here comes Rumbo. <laughs> Never seen him that excited. <laughs> but this is a perfect example for the economy. The part of the economy is already so screwed. The farm is now doubly screwed because you're buried under, uh, under a full dust storm. Life sucks. Is it Burton Cam again? Because he and I are about to fight in a minute. Cool, let him know. Want this, go ahead. So, through all this, it's an example of making the depression worse. Now, in is going to come a man by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he's going to have a little different view about what the government should do in problems like this. Okay? So, before we even look at his presidency or his election, while he's running for president, this is his view on public power, what the government should do uh, with companies, with utilities that maybe the government should run. So take four minutes, please, and skim this. And tell me, uh, when does Roosevelt view it as appropriate to use the federal government to intervene in business, and why? And how might this be different than Hoover's approach? All right, time's ticking. Get reading, go. Two and a half minutes left. About 90 seconds. A very clear difference in views on what the government could and should do. Okay. 
Get a good one. 50 seconds. Excellent. Talk to me. What does he think about this idea of, of the government taking things over? Mm -hmm. How is this similar or different to Hoover? Give me something, please. I will use Josh. What's up, man? Um, so I think Roosevelt did fail like, to kind of impose the government on the businesses. Boom, stop there. He sees it fit to impose the government on businesses. Riddle me this, Josh. Is that capitalism? No. Okay. Why does he see fit? When, why, how, what? This is, um, I think it's because uh, right now, like, the economic is struggling and I think it's up to the government. And it's just like... Fair. Right? He says, like, when, when a community or a state or a country sees a business not doing its job, like, the government should step in and it should be a publicly used utility. Good. Well done. Absolutely. That when necessary, the government should get involved in businesses and the economy and this and that, if necessary. Right now, it's quite clearly necessary because the whole country is covered in dust and life sucks. Good. Good, good. Uh, is this similar or different than Hoover's response? Different. different. Completely different. So here comes the election of 1932. And the Republicans somehow decide that re-nominating Hoover is their best chance. Oh, he says, that's a successful four years. Let's bring him back. The Democratic platform, what they're standing for, is very vague. It's not specific because nobody knows how to solve a problem that they've never been solved before. Their, their, their platform is, in general, wet. And they want to get rid of prohibition. Dry versus wet. And they think that the government should take more responsibility for human welfare. That's new. That's a social welfare state. The government taking responsibility for human welfare. So the Democrats nominate Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, who takes the nomination away from 1928 candidate, the Catholic Al Smith. He promises, in his words, bold action, and said the American people deserve a new deal. So then he called his program the New Deal. Uh, it's right, kind of right to the point. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt said the American people uh, deserve a squared. Square deal, three C's, corporations, right, conservation. Um, so his is called a new deal for the American people. And as you can see, America agrees. It's cute that Hoover wins Pennsylvania and a couple of New England states, but the rest of the country votes overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly for FDR. Not because he's that great, but because he's not Herbert Hoover. And damn it, that's enough. No more Hoover blankets. Not like going to be called Roosevelt blankets. Maybe they'll have a little bit of fuzzy stuff on them. Good. And this is what gives us our fifth party system. This is the first time, and in 36, it's even stronger. We'll go look at that uh, first thing on Monday morning. The Democrats get the black vote, the Catholic Jew vote, the progressive vote, and also a lot of the other votes from labor unions, low-income immigrants, and progressive intellectuals, white southerners. It's a very strong coalition that becomes known as the Roosevelt Co Coalition. Now, I don't need you to know who votes for what. Just know that this demonstrates that Democrats now stand for liberalism, progress, using the government to fix things, as opposed to keeping your hands off. And they also stand for Keynesian economics. This is not an economics class, so I'm not going to do much time on it. 
But Keynesian economic theory says when the economy goes down, the government should spend more money to fix it. So know that. It's a good term to know for your A. Bush test. It's a good term to know for life. Keynesian economics is basically when the economy dips, like so, government spending should go up. That will help the economy then recover. And then when the economy is good, government spending should go down because the economy is good. But that's where you think, see things like social welfare programs and the government funding infrastructure and bailing out of auto industries under Obama. That's an example of Keynesian economics. Okay? And the, dom the Democrats really do dominate Congress and the American public for the next 36 years. The Democrats dominate Congress and American politics until these guys leave the Democrats. This is a huge dominant voting block until these guys leave the Democrats over the issue of civil rights. When the Democrats become the party that pushes for civil rights reform in the 1960s, these guys jump over to the Republicans. Republicans are pro-business, which has gotten us into this place in the first place. Uh, economic conservatives, no government spending, which has gotten us here in the first place. Uh, way more socially conservative, so they're in favor of abol uh, abolition. Pro <laughs> That's a long time since I've been. Prohibition. Uh, more anti-immigrant, okay with quota acts, and they're mostly in the Northeast and parts of the Midwest, as you can see. So it's important that this is a shift in the democratic philosophy to be more spend heavy for social programs and social welfare driven, right? Much more welfare state. The Democrats now, you guys have asked this question a lot of times in the class, like, when do the Democrats become the Democrats like today? This is half of the question. This is half of the answer. This is the answer in terms of social spending and, the, and welfare programs. That's right now. In the 1960s, when these guys bounce over to here, that's when they fully become the Democrats of today. Cool? So I want you to read FDR's Depression Plan. This is his speech uh, during his campaign. He's not elected yet in May 22nd, 1932. Tell me. I put a nice, really in-depth, high-level question for you there. What's the plan? This is what he's saying on the Depression, how he's going to solve it. So tell me. Read it real quick. I'll give you three minutes. What is his plan? Hint. There is no plan. Three minutes. Go. What is his plan? Read it, hurry.
10 seconds. So, uh, in one word, what is his plan? Go ahead, and then yes. Go. Try or experimentation, the exact same thing. Let's throw a bunch of stuff at a wall and see what sticks. Which, I mean, at the very least, is more than Hoover's saying. The country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent, not action, experimentation. Like Val said, it is common sense to take a method and try. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. So FDR's plan is simply to do something and see what happens. Which may sound stupid in the short term, but in the long term, the, the world has never seen a situation like this. So we don't have tried and true responses to problems we've never experienced before. FDR takes office at the beginning of 1933. The U.S. economy is on the brink of even further collapse. Oh, wait, I the, thing. the U.S. economy is on the brink of even further collapse. Unemployment at 25 percent, and 38 states—not 38 banks—38 states have total bank failure. There is not a functioning bank in their state. There's no way to run an economy when there's no money in the bank to be put back into the economy by investment opportunities, and it's just all sorts of bad. FDR asks of Congress to give him as much power as possible. Request from Congress broad executive power to begin his new deal, his new programs to try. And Congress, do they have another option? Not really. Congress says, yeah, let's do it, whatever you say. Whatever you say. So I want you to read this quick letter from a 12-year-old boy in Chicago. He writes a letter uh, because... He can to the president. And I want you to tell me what aspects of the depression are most depressing for this young boy and why. And then I want you to think more so like what does it say about society and FDR that people are writing him letters. All right, three minutes, go. And then you're in for a long haul of me talking, so get used to it. Nothing. Keep moving. Shut up. Uh, it is. Forget my name. Like, what do you think I said about like him as president? What do you think I said about society? Like, what can you infer from that? Like, would you write a letter to a current president? Wow. Wow. God, you're so jaded. Well, would you write a letter to any president? If you were 12 right now. You write a letter to Donald Trump. No, no, why not? I mean, it's gonna be sent him a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, yeah, right? He could probably block me. <laughs> so let's talk about this letter real quick. Why is this kid depressed? Thank you. I have quick hands. Costanza. Oh, he's depressed because his dad can't find a job and, and he, his dad has been suffering on him. Yeah. Yeah, his dad can't find a job, his dad's been suffering. This is, 
at the beginning of uh, FDR's White House. Go ahead. There was no welfare and there was no money for rent. There's nothing. They can't pay their rent, they can't pay their grocery bills. It's been months and months. But what does it say about society and about FDR? That this kid is writing, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say that the White House is getting thousands of letters a week from kids and wives and mothers and fathers all over the country. What does that say about the way the country looks at FDR? Go. Are you saying Yeah, absolutely. That's the idea, is that the young generation is seeing hope because of FDR where before they did not see hope. Uh, the White House receives far more letters under FDR than they did Hoover probably because of that exact idea. I love that you used that idea of rugged individualism. He's like, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. He's like, well, I don't even have boots. <laughs> All right, let alone straps. So absolutely, right? It, it demonstrates a change in public opinion and hope, which I think the election map reflects. All right, there's hope there. FDR asks Congress for broad executive power that would be given to me if we were, in fact, invaded by a foreign foe. What is he asking for? Not just power, what kind of power? Emergency power, right? He's asking for like war power. If we're in a war, like the president kind of does whatever he wants because it's a war, right? Ask Lincoln in the Civil War, ask Wilson in World War I, right? Like you, you can do whatever you want because it's a freaking war. He's saying like, let me do whatever I want. This is a freaking war. But it's a war to save capitalism. It's a war to save our democracy. It's important. And I would argue that the propaganda posters that are used to sell the benefit of these New Deal programs are very war propaganda-esque as well. The US government mobilizes for the New Deal as if it was a war. Put the whole economy behind it, put the whole government behind it, put a whole public opinion behind it. Doesn't that look war-esque? Yeah, doesn't that look war-esque? Yeah. So, what the government does with FDR's rubber stamping and pushing is they treat the New Deal, they treat the Great Depression and FDR's administration like it is a war. Whatever, all, whatever's necessary. We can bend the Constitution, we can do some questionable things, we can tweak this, we can tweak that, we can look the other way for this, because we are at war. And instead of a military war against another country, it is a war to save their system from total and full collapse. But I argue that, like, look at this, it's treated like war. Looks like some of your war posters from World War I. Right? It is. So the three R's that you need to know are relief, recovery, and reform. Relief is right now. You are broke. You don't have a job. Let's get you to work. Let's get you some money. Let's get you some food in your fridge. Because I know you bought, you know you have a fridge. You bought it in the 20s on credit. That's how you're broke. Short-term goals are relief. Immediate action to halt the economy's deterioration and to give people what they need right now. Recovery is a longer-term game to prime the pump. This is Keynesian economics. To spend money into the economy by the government to then restart consumer demand. And then once consumers start spending money again, that will help fix the economy from the bottom up. That's recovery. And reform is arguably, in my opinion, the most important. Fix the economy so these problems don't happen again. Right? Look at reform movements. What are they supposed to do? Fix societal problems. This is a reform movement for the economy. Permanent programs to avoid another depression to make sure citizens are safe from economic disaster. So look at this is like people's needs, the economy's needs, and then long-term solutions to the problem. Very important. 
And then I put that box there for you guys so that you could like add programs to that as we go. So where are these ideas going to come from? Uh, much like later, we'll see from JFK and Lyndon Baines Johnson, and earlier from an Andrew Jackson. FDR is going to put around him a close group of advisors with a variety of different ideas. His cabinet includes, of course, mostly Democrats. He's a Democrat, but he even put some Republicans on his cabinet. Try to figure out, like, like, what are the best ideas? I don't care whose idea they come from. We need good ideas. Well, stop copying things now. You won't need to worry about it. Uh, the first woman to be on a, a presidential cabinet comes under FDR. Uh, her name is Frances Perkins, so she really sounds kind of like a woman. Um, but it's important because she's the first woman on a presidential cabinet. She's the Secretary of Labor. There she is. She's lovely looking. Uh, and these people around him are called the brain trust. They're the idea people. That's, this whole idea of like, let's experiment things, it comes off of them. And these, all these very important people from big businesses, uh, GMC Chrysler, their CEO comes and joins, uh, they get paid a dollar a year. So they're basically volunteering their services to try to help America. His brain trust. Now, he calls for the most bold action possible in the first hundred days of his presidency. It's called FDR's first hundred days. It's pretty accurate, because right, it's the first hundred days that he's president. So we're good. Okay, good. Uh, his first order of business, his first thing he needs to do right away is get confidence back in the banking system. If people don't trust the banks, will they put their money in the banks? No. No, and you don't put your money in the bank, the entire economy can't run, because the bank can't then go and reinvest, and it hurt, it slows down the entire economy. So his first order of business is to put the banking back together. What he does is he basically closes all banks in the country for four days. It's called the banking holiday. Does he have the power to do this? Probably not. Does he do it anyway? God, yes. Why? Because he's FDR. And because it's necessary. While the banks are closed, the government figures out, is this bank solvent? Is this bank financially responsible or not? In other words, does this bank have enough money in their deposits to give people back the money that the bank owes those people. And if the bank is, yes, financially stable, then they can reopen. And if they're not financially stable, but the, the country needs them, the government will fund that bank, give a loan to that bank. And if that bank is not financially stable, can't reopen. So it gets rid of banks, all, like almost like pet banks in Jackson's time, it gets rid of banks that aren't stable banking systems. And when banks are needed, they're going to open government-funded banks, government-backed banks. Then he gets on uh, his favorite method of communication. Anybody remember what it is from the reading? Fireside chats. He gets on the radio. Sounds like he's just talking to the American people from, from uh, next to a fireplace. And he asks them, trust the banking system. I promise it's okay. Put your money back in banks. What do Americans do? They put their money back in banks. All right, so this is the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. It's one of the very first things he does. And it just his first action is going to restore confidence in banking. This is important, however, because banks are now regulated. Not nationalized. The government doesn't take over the banks, but the banks are regulated. No more laissez-faire on banks. And therefore, the economic system is slightly reformed. This is a reform movement. It's not changed drastically. It's just modified so the government's going to regulate to make sure the banks are being stable. Shortly after, FDR and Congress passed what I consider one of the most important pieces of the New Deal, the Glass-Steagall Act, which creates the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which guaranteed all bank deposits up to $5,000. So now if you put your money in the bank, and you put your money in the bank, and you put your money in the bank, and that bank goes bankrupt, the government will give you back your money because it's insured by the federal government. This is a way to just make sure that, that who pays for that insurance? The banks themselves pay for it. So that way it makes sure that the banking industry is stable, and when you put your money in the bank, like that guy talking to the squirrel, that money's there when you come back to get it. And if not, the federal government will give it back to you. In 1933, it was $5,000. Now they insure up to $100,000. So if, and I don't, if I had $101,000 in the bank, 
and that bank went bankrupt, I'd get $100,000 back. This is why rich people have a variety of bank accounts. 100,000 here, 100,000 there, 100,000 there, because then they're all insured separately. Whereas I'm like, $18 here, $27 here, oop, got a negative balance over there, that's not gonna go to, so. But what this does is it creates confidence and stability back into banking, which fuels everything else. Very, very, very important that this is the first thing that happens. If you look at the number of bank failures, banks going bankrupt, we have 4,000 banks going bankrupt in 1933, a whole bunch more before that. See, to me, this is the problem of the 20s. This should have been a red flag. As many banks failing is a problem. How many banks since? Basically none. It was said because of this that capitalism as a system was saved in eight days. Through this banking holiday and the restoration of banking stability. So please know that Glass-Steagall Act, please know that it creates the FDIC which insures your money in banks. That's a big reform to our American economic system. It fixes the problem. Now his first attempt at economic recovery is the NIRA, the National Industrial Recovery Act. What does it do? It's in the title. It tries to recover the industrial capacity of the United States. It creates two organizations, the NRA, not the rifle one, not the crazy gun nut one, uh, but the National Recovery Administration, which for the first time, check this out, sets maximum hours and minimum wages. Huh. So labor unions have been asking for since the beginning of time, but again, it's kind of uncapitalist because it's not supply and demand, it's really what it is. Uh, and it, this is the, maybe where it goes a little off the wires. It stimulates industry by fixing prices. You're gonna charge this, you're gonna charge that, you're gonna charge this, you're gonna charge that. Capitalism? Invisible hand? No. Government telling you what you can charge is not capitalism and setting production limits. Hey, you're the problem. You're why we're in the Great Depression, because you overproduced for the last 37 years. Produce less. But that's hard to tell somebody to do that, because it feels like you're losing your freedom and your own business to produce whatever you want. Questionable. But it's better for the economy if overproduction caused the problem. It also creates the Public Works Administration, which is incredibly important, using government money to build roads, bridges, and buildings. This is Keynesian economics, using government spending to help fix the economy and put people back to work. Additional attempts to stimulate the economy, to make the economy better. Uh, the US goes off the gold standard for the last time, so there's more money freely available, and uh, we end prohibition. Why? So we can sell alcohol and tax it. The way I see it, if people are going to be broke, they might as well be drunk and broke as well, and the government can make a couple bucks off of it. <laughs> so we end prohibition in 1933 as well. But the NIRA is important because it, again, it tries to recover with the government controlling industries and the government spending money with infrastructure to improve these things. Other organizations we should note, they probably go into your box. FERA, the Federal Emergency Relief Act which gives re relief, right now on the spot relief, for poor people. 500 million bucks to states, so the states can fund soup kitchens and bread lines and homeless shelters and food and handing out checks to people that need it, that haven't worked. The Civilian Conservation Corps, very important, you look at some pictures in a minute, but they get put to work, like literally we're gonna hire you, you're unemployed, you're unemployed, you're unemployed, you're unemployed. Cool, we're going to hire you to go work on conservation projects. Go build a bridge in a national park. Go build a hiking trail to the top of a mountain in Yosemite. To conserve the earth. Who would have been happy with this? Roosevelt. Uh, he's the president, duh. Oh, the other Roosevelt. I see what you did there. Yes. Uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Super important because it could help control farm prices by limiting production. Which as a farmer, it's hard to hear, right? Yes, I know you produced 10,000 bushels of wheat last year. This year, you only produced 5,000. That sounds scary, doesn't it? I'm gonna produce less, I'm gonna make less money. And FDR is trying to convince them, hey, idiot, if you produce less, check this out. Check this out, it's crazy. You can charge more. 
and maybe you just maybe this year you'll actually sell all of your corn. So trying to get people to produce less, but it's hard to do. I already told you the NIRA, the EU government money to spend to build infrastructure, to build bridges and roads and canals. And one of my personal favorites is the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is right there in your notes. The Tennessee Valley Authority, which is the government paying money to build dams on the Tennessee River to do two things. To save that river from flooding every year, because it keeps flooding and flooding, that's bad, and it floods and it floods and it floods and it floods. If I can build a dam, it won't flood anymore. A bunch of dams, 200 dams. And when the water goes through that dam, it produces electricity. And the government can then sell that electricity to people that didn't have electricity before. In rural America. Give me a second to get caught up. Further on the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, because I argue it's the one thing that's significantly anti-capitalistic, it created dams in seven states. Check this out. This is the Tennessee Valley and the Tennessee River. Every year, this floods, or every couple years. Big rain, floods. Who does that suck for? <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Hilarious when people sneeze. <laughs> then, who does it suck for when this floods? The people that live there. Now, where are we see Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, north or south? Very south. So these people are in rural or urban areas. Rural. They don't have access to a lot of electricity. So the government is going to build all of these dams use the water flowing through those dams to spin giant turbines which creates electricity and they can then sell electricity to all these people that live here and now for the first time in these rural areas they have electricity who does that piss off sounds like a win-win doesn't it your, your land doesn't flood anymore, and you have electricity? People are always angry. What if Adrian here was a, a private electricity company trying to sell electricity to these people? And now he's out of luck because the government's selling electricity for cheaper. So it's a good, good early example of the government taking care of a utility, like FDR said in that speech you read just a minute ago. Also created for reform, you should go in your reform box, is the Security and Exchange Commission, which is going to regulate the stock market. This is what makes sure people don't buy stock on margin. Now you want to buy stock, you got to pay cash. Then at least you're not still paying for stock that lost value. It creates stability in the stock market where you're not inflating values because you can buy things on credit. It regulates the stock market, makes sure they're not buying on margin to make sure that that companies aren't watering down their stock and selling stock is not worth anything. Very, very important. What does it mean when stock is watered down? It means up to this point, companies can just print out as many stocks as they want. There's no verification what percentage you own to the company. So, like you might own 1% and then the company decides to print a bunch more stock, now your 1% is worth less. Yeah. Now they can't do that anymore because it's regulation of the stock market. The map already showed you. There's examples of the Tennessee Valley being dammed. <laughs> Look at all those people that get jobs, right? It solves a whole bunch of problems. It brings electricity to a rural area that have electricity. It puts people to work, and it builds infrastructure so that it doesn't flood anymore. Question, where does most of our electricity come from today in California? The plug, duh. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? Yeah, the electric company. Good job. They just pull it. <laughs> They're out there in a factory just putting together electricity packages. <laughs> you said it. Uh, uh, Hoover, Dam. Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam, fun story, which dams the Colorado River outside Las Vegas. It's huge. It's crazy. If you ever go see it, it's fantastic. Uh, which FDR, you've been there. Congratulations. I'll give you a sticker later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making this a shit. <laughs> um, Hoover Dam, which 
is uh, put together under FDR's watch, and he names it after Hoover. I think it's a nice little backhanded compliment. Like, oh, look, I did something. Since you did nothing, I'll name the dam after you. Oh. And then Hoover oh. Dam has actually then proved more beneficial than Hoover's entire presidency. <laughs> so, there's more pictures of the Tennessee Valley being dammed. Critics complained that the Tennessee Valley Authority is socialistic because it removes competition, because now the government owns all the electricity in this area. And they attacked the Tennessee Valley Authority for selling cheaper electricity, getting out of competition. So we don't mind when companies do this, but we mind when the government does, apparently. Interesting. So they argued that it's not capitalism, there's no competition, but the benefit is people now have electricity they wouldn't have had otherwise. Here we have the Civilian Conservation Corps, young men being put to work, paving roads, planting trees, building bridges. Creating a drainage system for an airfield in Washington. Working, fixing the country. Dredging a lake for a harbor so that the lake is, is fit so you can get boats into it. Here's the agricultural adjustment. Farmers getting checks for doing what? Producing less. Paying farmers to produce less stuff. But if overproduction is one of the reasons that caused this, you have to motivate people to produce less things. By the end of 1933, as you can see, in, oh, where are the states that get most of the federal help? The South. Of course. Still true. Um, <laughs> in the states that are red, over 15 percentage of families are already on government relief just six months into the New Deal. The green states between 8 and 15 percent, and the blue states are below 8 percent. So still a giant chunk of the country within six months is already on federal relief of some kind. And that's action. That's something. One of the other huge successes of the first New Deal comes from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which gave relief. Relief checks just printed and sent and cut by Uncle Sam to people that need it. And as I already mentioned, the Federal Emergency Relief Act giving $500 million into state-run welfare programs. So the states can figure out who needs help and give it out. So relief is a big success of the first New Deal. So I'm going to give you a second and just read those two quick songs, or poems, if you will. I know. That's where we are. Uh, these are poems written by young men working from the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. I'll put the picture back up for you. And what do they have to say? What do they highlight about their new work in the world? Uh, take two minutes and just skim them. They're just quick little poems that are used to work by these young men. What do they highlight about their work? What excites them? What frustrates them? Where are they at? Alright, 
So what do you note in these poems? What tone do they hold? What are they excited about? What's going on in their lives? Go ahead, please. So what really stood out to me was the last paragraph on the left side. Uh-huh. He talks about how he's, he's earned food. Yeah. Who's the he? He gave us a chance to say, I've earned my bread and keep today. Oh, the FDR. Yeah, FDR. Right, so they're giving FDR a ton of credit for this new program that's allowing them to work. Right, it gets them fed. They're working. They sign up for contracts that are a year or two years in length. That's why the guy says, I'm a sucker until my time runs down. He's just there with a thousand pound hammer. That sounds terrible. They're paid 30 bucks a month. But the key is they're fed and they're housed and they're clothed so they don't need any money because they're working every day out in nature, 25 of that $30, it gets sent home to their families every month. So they're working, and the benefit is being sent back to the eastern cities that their families are living in. It's a win-win. It's getting a young man out in nature. Teddy Roosevelt would have loved this program. And he did those for his life. So. Excellent. So the moral of the story for FDR's first new deal is it is something. It is a new deal. Look at this here. We've got bank legislation, his inaugural address, said the only thing to fear is fear itself. Stop being scared. Let's figure it out. And it looks like we're doing the right thing. FDR is happy. I love this quote. Even the hand of an iron dictator is in preference to a paralytic stroke. So it's obviously the candidate against FDR in 36, but saying like, at the very least, maybe he's acting dictatorial. Maybe he's acting like an economic dictator, but at least he's doing something that's prefer preferable to somebody who has a paralytic hand not doing anything. True irony is the fact that uh, FDR is paralyzed from the waist down. <laughs> but, you know, that would be his irony. Is it a wheelchair? Yeah, he's in a wheelchair. And nobody ever, most of the public doesn't know it. They find a way to keep it hidden from, from almost his entire residency. Well, there's no social media. Yeah, he's sitting, waving from cars, right? They, they organized the White House with ramps so they can load him into a car. It looks like he's just hanging out there, minding his own business. Yeah, life's good. I know. The whole, the whole press has an agreement. We can talk about it later if you guys want, but the whole press has an agreement like, to not report it. Imagine that today. Like, oh, I have this little thing with Russia. Just don't report it. Oh, Will Rogers, famous musician and actor, as the whole country is with him. Just so he does something. If he burned down the Capitol, we would cheer and say, well, at least we got a fire started somehow. <laughs> so it's really important to understand that, that FDR may not be perfect, but his action is action. However, he is criticized. He's criticized by a few different angles of things. In 1933 and 34, the New Deal focuses on immediate problems, obviously. But it does very little to help unskilled labor and industrial jobs, and it does very little to help farmers. By 1935, FDR shifts his approach from economic relief to more reform of the system as a whole. There are three people you should know that we'll look at again on Monday who criticize him and get national attention. The first is Father Charles Coughlin, who asks him to nationalize the U.S. banks, but he loses credibility for being anti-Jewish. The two others are arguably more important. Francis Townsend has this great idea that we should start paying money to old people for being old, because that will do two things. It will make sure that they don't have to work because they're old, and it will get them out of the workforce which then allows those companies to hire new people, more employment. And then those old people will spend their money and that will help the economy and everything good. And the last is Senator Huey Long and his Share the Wealth program. His is a little more radical. And he said we should tax the rich a high rate so we can give $2,500 to each American. And we'll look a little bit at these critiques again on Monday. Now tell me, why doesn't the first New Deal end the Great Depression? Why not? Why doesn't it fix things? 
Go ahead. It didn't necessarily aim at the farmers, it only aimed at urban, urban women. To an extent. I'd argue also that the problems are way too big to fix in two years. Right? We fixed the banking, we fixed we put people back to work, but we have still haven't fixed the fact that the rest of America is still broke as can be. The first part of the second New Deal, you should note. I already told you the second difference in the first that's more focused on reform is the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, which you saw in the Do Now, that put that, that woman's, uh, that lady's dad to work. It's the most comprehensive direct assistance program in the New Deal. It's the biggest program of the entire New Deal. The national government hires 10 million people, just hires 10 million unemployed people to try to stimulate the economy because it gets them into work, it gets money in their pockets, and then they can spend that money to prop up the rest of the economy. Now the Works Progress Administration builds all kinds of things. Airports, landing strips, buildings, bridges, but it also does things like funds artists, murals, puts artists to work. It pays for traveling troops of actors to go town by town putting on plays pushing for the arts in people's lives. So it employs all kinds of people and all kinds of projects as long as they're for the public. The Works Progress Administration. It's kind of cool. Now the WPA makes a big deal. It helps a lot, but they never actually employ enough people to stimulate consumer purchase enough to end the depression, which shows you how crazy it is that hiring 10, 10 million people isn't enough. But it does make the depression more bearable. It puts people to work, it makes them less miserable, and if it doesn't have works progress uh, projects for society, that makes the depression less miserable. And that makes a big deal. Here we go, they're digging some sort of a ditch, maybe for plumbing. But how many people do you see there in the picture? A lot. How many of them are working? Oh, they are? You guys are working, that guy's working, that guy's pointing. <laughs> He's supervising, yeah, there we go. Michael Bush. <laughs> now, uh, the, one of the critiques is they cared less about what got done as long as something got done. So yes, there's cool things like building hospitals, building schools, building airport fields, but there's also people that are getting paid to move leaf piles, right? to dig ditches, things that anybody could do. So one of the critiques is that uh, all these people do is just hanging out, minding their own business. And that's, you guys saw that in the do now. That complaint uh, about the people to the daughter that says, the discussion was always the, the WPA, these lazy people, the shovel leaners. Leaning on shovels. Huh, let's go back. A couple shovel leaners in that picture. Hanging out, leaning on their shovel. Minding their own business. Right? So that's the critique of the WPA. And maybe the most important long-term program is Social Security. Social Security is the first ever U.S. welfare program for the age, the old people, it's a fancy way of saying old, the Craig Winchells of the world, the disabled, and the unemployed. And the way it works is you pay all this money as you work your whole life, and when you're 65, you're eligible to receive a monthly check from Social Security. It's significant because it makes sure that in America, you don't have to work until you die. That at a certain point, you've worked long enough that the society can then take care of you. It's a big deal. It still exists today, and it ensures two things. One, people don't work until they die, and two, that after the age of 65, we can get people out of the workforce and then hire young, unemployed people. So, and then those old people that aren't working, what do they have? Money. What do they do with that money? Spend it. What's that going to do? Help the economy. It's a neat idea. So the idea is that once you're 65, you can receive this money. Also, if you are unemployed, you can receive some money. But more importantly, if you are disabled, you can receive money as well. So Social Security is a huge deal. Of course, it doesn't make everybody happy. Liberal critics argue it doesn't do enough. It doesn't help society and old people enough. And conservative critics, more importantly, argue that it violates individualism and relying on yourself. 
but it's significant because it is America's first welfare program to help individuals. And here is a monthly check to you for the rest of your life, beginning when you're 65. So you work long enough, and you, you the, the amount now the way it works is the amount of money you get back is uh, it's not your money because right now I pay Social Security and that's going to old people now because it's not you're not putting money in for yourself because when they started it they started it on day one if you're 65 you can get the money they hadn't been putting money in all that time so the young generation is always paying for the older generation but the more the more money you make the more money you get back per month Social Security I know. Also, super importantly during the Great Depression is labor reform. For the first time, we have an act that legalizes the negotiation for labor unions. It's called the Wagner Act. You know it, you know it, you know it, because the college board loves labor unions and labor progress. The Wagner Act creates the national labor, the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, which oversaw negotiations between labor and management. Who else would have agreed with this? Who would agree with this idea of the government overseeing negotiations between labor and management? Uh, hmm? The other Roosevelt, what the hell is his name? Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt right? <laughs> with the anthracite coal strike, the government steps in, acts as the negotiator, the rest of you all should probably answer the same thing. I know it's a long day, get over it. It's a long day for me too. What this does is it mandates management. That you have to negotiate. If there's a union, unions are legal, you have to negotiate with them. If it's regarding pay or hours or working conditions, if the majority of your workers vote for a union, it's too bad, you have to have a union. That now, for the first time, unions are legalized and authorized to act as negotiating partners for the workers. And the Fair Labor Standards Act also creates the first minimum wage nationwide and maximum hour laws. So even non-unionized workers got help as well. This is considered like the Magna Carta, the founding document for labor unions. The Wagner Act is super, super important. At the time, it was 40 cents per hour was minimum wage. 40 cents an hour. But it was 40 hours a week, which is what people wanted in the first place, right? All those years in the Gilded Age, it was 10, hour, 10 hours a day, 6 days a week. Now it's 40 hours a week. If you work more than that, you're eligible for overtime. Unless you're like me and you work a salary, not hourly job, in which case I can work 100 hours a week and it wouldn't matter. But that's my own research. <laughs> now this is criticized, and I'll let you take one minute to look at this cartoon with your partner and have a little conversation to snap out of it. What is the point of view of this cartoon in regards to the Wagner Act and FDR's policy on labor union? Take a minute, chat it out, what do you have going on? Five seconds. So, what is this cartoon trying to demonstrate about FDR's policy towards labor unions and the Wagner Act and the like? Talk to me, please. George, go ahead. <laughs> but no, I could just sit there silently. We've got to speak sometimes. What is this cartoon? What is this cartoon trying to, to say about these new labor policies? Allowing labor unions to exist and making sure the government lets them exist. Take the hood off your face and speak to me. All that what? Categorize it, generalize it. Is this pro or anti Wagner Act? Why? I agree with you. Uh, Scarlett, take a shot at it. Um, you could see, you could definitely note that it's anti because um, 
as shown by one of the guys that sees communists, so it's perceived as like radical and like up, uplift, upholding um, socialism. Isn't that what the co complaint about labor unions has always been? That they're just a cover up for, for communism and radicalism, the redistribution of wealth, political barons and labor barons, these utopian dreamers, collectivism, communism, yeah. Now this nice new policy of letting labor unions exist is great, but all it's going to do is cover up for all these communists and crazy workers that are now authorized to exist in this country. So uh, not everyone likes the fact that FDR is allowing labor unions. The people that aren't going to like that are like the, the Republicans, the big business supporters, because this damages the power of big business. Very important. Good. So conclusions, those three parts, recovery, relief, reform, I'm going to argue that immediate relief is the most successful because it eases people's short-term suffering. They have hope, they have jobs, they have programs, they have food. The New Deal does not end the depression and it does not bring a long-term economic recovery. It makes things better, it does not fix things, but it does bring major, major, major reforms to society. Significance? For the first time, the government uses can you see economics? Attention, boxers. Sorry for the interruption. If you are in Mr. Padilla's fifth period, you need to report to Mr. Padilla's room at lunch. Your lunches will already be in there. So again, if you are in Mr. Padilla's fifth period, you need to report like you can email to Mr. Kids. Padilla's room <laughs> during lunch. Food will already be there. Thank you. Thanks for having my day. Um, so the Keynesian economics is important. For the first time, the government is using deficit spending, spending money to solve economic problems, instead of letting that cycle just carry itself out. That's what the government now often does today. That's important. It's a turning point. For the first time, the government takes more responsibility for the health of the nation's economy and the health of the nation's citizens and the long-term stability of the nation's economy and the success of capitalism. By regulating the banking industry, by providing jobs, by hiring 10 million people, by creating programs, it's the very, way more active role in the government that didn't exist before. That matters. It was necessary. All right, what if Hoover had another presidency? Oh like, it would have potentially gone forever. And the New Deal signals the beginning of the welfare state. Whether you like or dislike benefits to people that need it, this is the first time we see this happening on a large scale, and it's something that still is, it plays a huge role in our budget today. Not as much as guns for the military, but hey. I put up here some important programs you should note. I'll come back to this in a second so you can categorize them on your little grid. But it's important that we know that there are some critics. The American Liberty League is anti-New Deal because they are industrialists, big business, who oppose all these policies that tell them how much to charge, how much to pay people, how much they can produce. Of course, big business doesn't like this because it's the government getting involved in big business. So that's a conservative critique, saying it's doing too much. It's gone too far. The government's too big. Liberal critiques like Francis Townsend, I already told you about. I think they're not doing enough for old people. Father Charles Coughlin is upset because it's not doing enough of nationalizing things like the banks. We're not doing enough for social justice. We're not doing enough to make sure people are equal. And Huey Long, as I already told you, is upset because... We're not taxing the rich, even though there's not that many rich people anymore. It says it's the share our wealth plan. He wants to tax the rich and redistribute money. His is super socialism, yes. Huey Long. <laughs> Huey! Uh, and he gets and he then gets assassinated in nineteen ninety five. He's gonna run for president against FDR and he gets shot and killed. <laughs> for having a name Huey. You know, don't name your kids Huey. But there are critics on both sides. The conservatives that say it's going too far, it's too much government control, the super far liberals think it's not doing enough. It doesn't fix all of the problems right now. Despite that, in 1936, as you can see, FDR is kind of a popular dude in America. Look at that. 
Yeah, he, he gave away actual blankets. Life was good. No, uh, in 1936, in one of the biggest presidential election wins of all time, FDR wins 523 electoral votes to eight. But again, I told you, where's the Republican base? New England? Boom, boom. There they are. Interesting. Yeah, uh, good for him. He wins Vermont and Maine. Maine, which wouldn't even be a state without the Missouri Compromise. Oh, my God. I know. So I got to throw the reviews in there. Uh, and it's important that we understand that despite the fact that the New Year doesn't end the Great Depression, it does a very good job of bringing relief, and people are a big fan of what he does. Both sides in 36 avoid the real issues. Republicans attack the New Deal as too socialistic. They don't even offer an alternative. They have no other plan to fix the problem. So they are then uh, not elected. FDR wins 46 out of 48 states, which to him is a mandate to continue doing what he's already doing. Because apparently it works. My timing is excellent. I have two minutes. So I'll put the grid back up, take a look at these programs and try to figure out if they are relief, recovery, or reform. So you can add a couple to your grid. I will pass out your homework for Monday. It's a very short chapter. And make sure I get your uh, essay that was due today so I can give you credit for having read it. If you have your LEQ and you want it